I have with me, as ever, uh, Anne Lord Jackson, our resident sensory um, expert. Depending on what you've, you're struggling with, um, what did we learn last week? Well, there's more than five senses. There's seven plus an eighth that is a group of senses. Woo. So that was fun. <laughs> That's impressive. Well done, you. I know. <laughs> well, that sort of thing sticks in your head because you think, when I was at primary school, there were the five senses, and now I'm told there's seven plus another group, <laughs> which makes sense when you say it. But of course, that's really, really simplistic, isn't it? It is, but that that's how I and, and, and if that's what people get, then brilliant. I, I'm I'm all up for that. The simpler the better if it means that it makes sense and that people understand it and it helps them understand themselves and other people better. Brilliant. And I do wonder, actually, before we get to some questions, whether that over simplistic um, teaching in schools, perhaps that's not helping our understanding of sensory issues because we're thinking, well, it's just touch or it's sound or but actually there's so much more going on. I, I, it made me think, is that perhaps you think maybe one of the reasons why we're not so great at more easily understanding and facilitating help for people with sensory issues? Oh, now there's a profound thought. Mm. Absolutely. We need to be in. We need to get into education. We we need to be starting it right from little so that there is that understanding. And all of a sudden, when somebody is clumsy or when somebody uh, acts a bit bizarrely, it's just like, oh, yeah, I get that. I understand that. And and, and you just dispel, dispel so many things right from right from little, you know, and, and children are amazing with what they understand. It's just like, oh, yeah, but, you know, they they, they trip up and that's remember when you were doing that you know all babies and toddlers kind of trip up and that's how we learn but the brain grows and integrates and when people are still doing that when they're older it's because they're not integrated because they're not feeling from their muscles and their joints and they don't know their they can't control their bodies the way that you can and mm. just really simple things can little children can can grasp so yeah I mean, we don't want to overcomplicate things because simple is good, right? But actually, mm. a, a deeper understanding isn't necessarily this is going to be much more complicated. It just means we have a better grasp of some of the, the basics of how we function and facilitate life. Yeah, I love what the more we understand about how we're made, how we've been designed, it is just remarkable. So when we were like... Uh, l learning and listening and reviewing this week about what happens in in the development in the womb it's just the way that our all our senses are developing and oh, I can't remember what you're saying but it, it just made me think about yeah just remarkably made and just remarkably put together and it, it it's so simple but yet so profound and if folks want more that's what I always love the beauty of everything that we do is just like you can take things at one level and that will do you know that's great work with it love people be compassionate help them but for those who have that intellectual capability and capacity and want more boy there's so much more deeper down and and you delve into the neuroscience and you delve into our psychology you delve into how sensory processing affects so much of who we are and it gets yeah it's really exciting if you have that mind and if you don't have that mind that's fine we'll just stay at an, an, another level of, of which we functionally make make a difference yeah, no, that's cool. We, there's always something new to learn, isn't there? Mm. Right, let me dive into some questions then that have coming in. Um, let's start with this one. Uh, how do I know I, my son has sensory issues? Oh, that's a biggie. That's a biggie. Um, there are um, different types of sensory issues. So that's the first thing to recognize that your son may not have all the different facets. We basically have three different types. Do you want me to go into detail? As to the yeah, yeah, you're up for that. Okay, so we have the, the 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 modulation side of things, which is where you might respond to you might not respond that appropriately to the sensory information that comes in. So it is being overreactive to certain things. That's the smallest noise sends you know sends you off. You really don't want people touching you. Um, you might be completely oblivious to certain sensory input. Um, if somebody cuts their hair, you have no idea. That they cut their hair because it's it's not significant enough of a change for you to even recognize it. Um, so there are people who don't register things very well, and there are people who are really picky and particular about lots of sensory input. Um, that would be a question of working through all the senses. If they do go to the AnnLawJackson.com website, from there there are free resources where it describes different types of sensory processing, and so it's easier to try and pick out. Um, the clusters of behavior that might look like something that's worth 
addressing. We all have sensory issues. We are all sensory beings. Just sometimes those clusters get in the way of life. So that's where we'd want to get in and do something about it. So you have those modulation ones. Then you have the discrimination ones. And they're the ones that can't pick out the detail in what in the environment, in their own body. If they're falling over, they know they're falling, but they don't know which way they're falling. So they don't put their hands out to save themselves because they haven't registered direction of movement or they're not registering their body well enough and they can't discriminate just quite how much force to use to, to stop to save themselves. Or it's that force of when you're picking up a cup and you're not going to squash it and squeeze it too hard. That's all discrimination. That's grading. Um, and that's another type of sensory processing. And then the other ones, the, the last section, subsection really, are the sensory based motor issues. So if they are clumsy, uh, uncoordinated, then they've got, you know, not not good at holding themselves up where they slouch over the tables, um, their, their, their muscle tone, their, their muscle, their, their body sense. It, it's a really a motor thing. When we talk about motor, we're not talking about motor cars. We're talking about gross motor, fine motor, the ability to motorically do things, motor things w- with our body. So physically do things. So rather than things that we think or respond to, it's about how our muscles respond and are able to do things so that's the sensory based motor issues um that can come from not processing well so but i would i would go and get the free resources really um and there's a there's a deeper a deeper uh, line of things to consider to know if 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 there are sensory issues involved and lots of reading there's lots of resources out there to be able to read background information um, but basically, if it's getting in the way of life, if, if it's bothering you, if it's bothering them, or if they're being overwhelmed at school, um, or if there are behaviours that you don't understand, then it is definitely worth reading up about what sensory processing issues can look like. So I've got books on Amazon as well. I just oh yeah, I forgot, forgot to tell you that. <laughs> I don't know if you know that, but there you go. So there are, there are some books, especially about raising a sensory child or home educating a sensory child with ease. Those two books are available on Amazon if folk want to explore and find out more, if that's all right to mention. <laughs> yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, so in terms of how how would I know my um, son or, or daughter has got sensory issues, that as a parent or friend or teacher, you're going to be thinking, I suppose the first thing you're going to be, it's more of a question, isn't it? Is is that repeated behaviour? Is that normal? I mean, we try and assess, is what I'm seeing normalised with other people to, to make it stand out? But then your website can help people from that point of view. Yeah, yeah, because and that that is the big question because we are because we're also different. We do have certain norms, but there's a lot of things that go on in the background that people don't realise are sensory issues, and that's the hard thing. The struggles about people getting dressed in the morning, about putting their clothes on, they don't know because they don't see it. Most people don't talk about it. That actually, you, people just turn up at school and everybody's kind of dressed, and they haven't they haven't seen what's happened in the last two hours. They haven't seen the struggles and the tantrums and the the tears. And just it literally just to get out the door, it, it, it's kind of massive. And those things are hard to, to to share and you don't know how to bring those up in conversation. Uh, but they are they are important. And they are real. And that's where it's just dig a little deeper. If there's something that you're struggling with, it doesn't feel like parenting or that parenting is harder than you thought it was going to be. Uh, then it's worth reading a little bit more. Hmm. Asking those questions. Hmm. Right. Well, here's another question which came from um, some of your network, which is great. Um, is home education always the best thing for sensory needs? Oh, that's a biggie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. OK, the <laughs> biggest thing, because our sensory processing is a lot about being environmentally dependent. So that means that the environment that you live in makes and that you work in and that you study in and that you spend your time in has a big impact on how you process sensory information. So the first answer would be absolutely being at home is amazing because parents will typically be really sensitive to the child and the child is allowed and has the ability to to make choices about when they want to move, how much light, how much sound, how much uh, touch experiences they get during the day. They're totally in control of their sensory experiences so that then they can focus on academics 
um, which at this point is 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 mainly what we're doing in, in childhood. Education itself is a, is a big word, and whether you call someone homeschooling or home educating, I know there's a big debate um, about that. But essentially, it is about educating them. It is about schooling them. It is about learning things and growing. So when they are in an environment where senses are honoured and they're in a good place, they're in a healthy place, any form of education and schooling and learning is going to happen much more easily. So that's, I think, from that perspective, home ed is brilliant. Um, and it really cuts out half of the issues that families have because of the stresses and strains that that happen at school. Uh, and you remove that from the environment and then they're more able to, to, to thrive and flourish at home. Hmm. The downsides of that if, if there are downsides, the opposite to that is that if you have um, various other um, uh, siblings at home, obviously there are different sensory needs within the family. And it takes a deeper awareness of each family member for each one to function well. So it is totally doable. You just need to be quite adaptable and you need to do really good assessment in that perspective so that you can all function well so that the mum who might have sensory processing issues herself and maybe doesn't realize it parents can often get overwhelmed because of the general um effervescence of of children and if the, if the parents are quite uh sensory sensitive they're quite overreactive in their senses they will get exhausted and it will be quite a kind of a, a wipeout situation because there's a mismatch and they haven't understood both the parents' sensory needs and the children's sensory needs, or the siblings. So we just need a good understanding for that to work well. And then the other side, from the school's perspective, if they are working well, and that's why I love the school's work that I do do to try and support them, because when schools are able to support it well, they do really well. Um, and they can often actually purchase, I know schools have a budget, but they're often able to, able to provide, certainly the schools that I'm working in at the moment, they are able to provide facilities and sensory experiences that would be huff, tough financially for some of our parents to do. So schools can provide things really, really well, um, but they need to know what they're doing. They need a really good assessment of, of the child themselves. Um, so it, it, it's not as it's not as straightforward as it used to be. And certainly my answer in the past would have been absolutely just take them out of school and just give them that opportunity to de-stress from, from, from the environment that is so sensory overloading. Whereas I think the understanding is growing and certainly the schools that have engaged with such a, a humility really to take on board and understand sensory processing, then they are really doing what they can to, to support those in school and, and long may that continue if that's what the parents want so there are things that I mean I remember my first secondary school had been specifically set up for um children who had sight issues so one of the things that I noticed on my first days was all the steps on the staircases have got white paint that's always very very bright and it was yeah. so that people who are hard of sight have got some visual stimulus of there's a step um, and there was a whole centre in the school as well that was was set up around it. It wasn't really a big thing or made a big thing, but it's certainly something they did. And actually, as simple as it was, white paint, um, Braille on doors with with strips. They can follow a strip to a Braille message that said, this is such and such a class, so they knew where they were. All of that was really simple and would have cost the school pence, but actually yeah. benefited everybody because actually those white uh, the white markings on the stairs, I was quite glad of them, actually, and I wasn't hard of sight. Um, yeah. because it's easy to spot in a dark classroom or, you know, when you've got 300 kids running up and down staircases to spot where the stairs are. It's actually quite a, a simple, valuable thing, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Big time. And also it then educates, again, it educates children who will grow up into more compassionate and understanding adults that actually this is, this should be the norm, the way that we honour those, yeah, visual impairment, uh, hearing, just everything that, that's different from the from the basic senses and and wheelchairs and ramps and then and then that sensory stuff and um, it was quite. Uh, I was at an education meeting recently and I was saying it'd be really good if we could have um, a swing hook in in the classroom, and uh, and and the head of the ed education department said, "Oh, that'll never happen." Um, I think because the concept was just that weird, 
Um, and I thought, oh, yeah, crumbs, I, I am so far down the line that I just think that's normal. And I think that's what should happen. But for anybody else who's never heard that before, it's like, what? No, chat, that, you know, that will never happen. So it's always like, OK, right. OK, let, let, let's see what the future holds. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that there, there is a lot. There's a lot of change coming. It's education, isn't it? It's learning and it's, it's understanding and being open to the fact that, like you said, that humility thing with schools. We, mm. we have to understand, first of all, we don't have all the answers. We don't know everything. And therefore, if we don't have all the answers, others do. And if others do, then we can start to allow them to speak. But, it, you know, there's a journey of education, isn't there? Yeah, it is. And there's lots of fears around change. Um, yeah, with, with lots of things. But then just a simple experience of someone doing something different um, and seeing it work and seeing how it's not disruptive to the class. Um, but actually, it really helps the class. I mean, that that's the beautiful thing of the, of the changes that we've been working with. Um, and having we've even got portable swings into classrooms because we weren't able to get ceiling fixings um, because of the, the, the designs of, of things that were going on. And, and I thought, oh, crumbs, this is this is much more intrusive than literally just having a hook in the ceiling in which you, you can just put something up and, and down when it's necessary, when you can tell that the, the children need or a child in the classroom needs something different. But one of the teachers was reporting that because they know that that one particular student who was affecting the others in the class was really happy on the swing. She says, even with this piece of equipment in the back of our classroom or at the side of our classroom, that we're really happy because that child is happy and they're not disturbing anybody else. So I can actually get on and teach properly. You know, I can actually communicate, I can engage, I can help the other students with where they're at. And the other one is more than happy and still within the classroom environment. So you haven't got to have a TA to take them out. Um, and it's all within that, all within the classroom. So it's been really, really, really lovely. But the proof is in the pudding, really. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's that cascade approach though, isn't it? If you help one person out, it's less of an issue, it costs less after the investment and you can help more people. Yep. Right, here's a question for you from Anonymous. Uh, I've been sick for a while, suffering from nausea and occasional sickness. As a result, I seem to have become much more sensitive to smells and tastes. So cooking and cleaning generally makes me feel ill and I become quite a fussy eater. There are some smells I find pleasant, especially when they remind me of times when I wasn't ill. How can I make my life easier in the same way that you might deal with sensory issues? Wow, absolutely brilliant. Okay, okay. So what have we got there? So we've got smells. So we've got eating. What was the other thing? Uh, smells and tastes in a good and bad way. So there are some smells that are pleasant because they remind them of times when they weren't ill. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, smells and tastes. So cooking and cleaning generally makes me feel ill. So I'm yeah. guessing cleaning products and just the, the very nature of smells of cook cooking, which yeah. has made them become much more fussy on their eating. I'm guessing yes. that means they weren't before. Yeah, yeah, presume so. So we have a, a lot of this at the moment would be more management techniques. Um, I can go into a little bit of the neuroscience of, of smell to be able to explain some of this. That... Yeah, yeah, do. It's good. Education is good. <laughs> so smell goes directly into. So our factory bulb is at the top of the nose and there is a direct. Oh, what, line. sorry? What was that? The olfactory bulb? Oh, okay. I thought you had factory bulb. That's what I, I was like, have I misheard? Old okay. olfactory. Yeah, the smell. <laughs> um, our smell receptors. Um, olfactory bulb at the top of the nose to, has a nerve that takes it straight into the limbic system in the middle of the head. That's our emotional center. So that's where, as she was saying, or he was saying, that they connects to, to positive things sometimes. Um, most sensory input goes actually into the bottom of our neck, um, the brain stem, well, the bottom of the brain that's at the top of the neck, um, the brain stem area. And that's where the main processing goes in normally for the other senses. All the other senses from the body get processed at the bottom of the brain in the brain stem and then come up to the thalamus and other, other areas and then get pushed out and back and forth there's lots of networks and lots of stuff that ha that fires around the brain smell is different because it goes straight into the middle of the brain and doesn't get processed at the bottom so it is very very quick it is um we don't treat smell in the same way that we would the other senses so it's about replacing or removing smells effectively 
So it really is looking for cleaning products that you do like the smell of. So it just takes a little investment to try different types of cleaning products. Um, trying to find things, um, if you're okay with vinegar, you know, vinegar is a very strong smell, but it's a very natural smell. So it's trying to discern which of the smells are the ones that do affect you. Chemical smells sometimes are worse than natural smells. So that's what I was saying about vinegar. Even though it's a strong smell, it's natural and can be a lot more um, readily perceived and uh, assimilated in the brain, but that might not be the case for them. So it's trying to find what natural products, what products are out there that don't actually smell to enable them to function, to enable them to actually do the cleaning that they want to. Um, so that would be the, the first line. And then the second line would be the fact we do have nose clips. Um, so you can, it's like swimming when people go swimming okay. and they put clips over their nose and it just stops for that period of time. Uh, you wouldn't wear them all the time but just for certain events. Uh, if they eat at home, it could be that they, if, if they particularly have always loved bolognese, but now they can't, if a nose clip to actually stop the smell going into the nose, they can appreciate the food. They will lose an awful lot of the flavor, but taste is affected anyway because of smell. So um, if they would like to enjoy a bolognese again, at least psychologically, they may not enjoy the taste while their senses are quite heightened to lots of things. Um, but at least they can feel satisfied that they've maybe had something that they did enjoy before. And that is satisfying, even if the food isn't as satisfying as it was because the taste, it, the smell, stroke taste is taken away. Because most of taste actually comes from smell anyway. We've only really got four or five um, main tastes, the sweet, the sour, the umami, the bitter. Um, all, all those, those are our main tastes. The, the, the nuances of taste come from smell. So that's why, you know, they will be affected by both taste and smell. So it's both managing it and, uh, replacing smells, having a, a stronger smell in the background would be the only other thing that I would say. So okay. if they, they, if they like those plug-in things, um, those that, that give out smell, or they like spray smells have lots of that in the environment while they have to cope and yeah cope with the other smells that are really off-putting the smell one is interesting learning about it because um a few years ago now i had ptsd therapy uh with cbt and mm. they used smell to trigger memories where i was struggling to recall stuff wow and i was quite shocked how much Okay, stop thinking about the you know the other four senses. Think about smell. How 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 vivid that was as a spark for a memory. And I was quite shocked at the vivid detail. And they said that's normal, but for yes. me it was just how can I recall that stuff? And they said that's the smell. Yeah, because when it goes into the, the limbic system, the amygdala, the hippocampus, all of those memory bits of our brain, um, that they're all in that limbic system. So smell, memory, bingo. You know, wow. that's what we're, that's what we're dealing with. So it's dealing with the smells. It just took me back to the, the therapy I'd had because it was, right. I couldn't remember something. And it was like, think of the smell. And it was like, wow, it was like a light bulb. It was just this cascade of memory. It was, it was so powerful to think. And when you said about smell, I thought, yeah, it's ridiculously powerful, but now I understand why. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's where going back to our folk with dementia, who may be losing lots of other faculties, we've still got smell. So let's use smell. To, to, to get that engagement and, and connect um, with folk because smells will still be there. The memories will still be there somewhere and, and the smell is the best way of bringing it out. Wow. Uh, one more then, which I know again came from your network. Um, uh, pregnant women and what can be done to help them create the best sensory health in uh, utero? Oh, ah, it's so precious. Our time, the baby's time in the womb is, um, let, me, let me talk about all of the different experiences that go on in the development. There'll, there'll be another conversation, I'm sure, sometime about the actual neurodevelopment from fetus, from the time of conception right the way through and, and how that development works through. But when when the baby's actually in the womb, let, let, let's start there. Um, you can tell from a sight perspective, um, Babies inside the womb will turn towards the light. Obviously, they are enclosed. They're in skin, um, but they can still see light on the outside. I didn't know that. There you go. That's cool. 
<laughs> yeah, it's cool, isn't it? It's amazing the, the number of things that go on inside the room. It's just like, oh, wow. Uh, yeah, so that they will turn their, their, their heads to light. Um, so it's great to have different light experiences for them. And even if you have flashing lights or this, that, and the other, be just like, oh, um, again, sound, they will turn and orient their head because most of us will choose to um, position our ears so that we get it in good stereo. So if someone's talking to us, well, yes, we want to see them, but we also, we don't want to be like, the more head on we can be to a sound experience, um, the, the better. So again, in the womb, there will be orientation and changing and moving um, towards sounds. Um, so yes, playing lots of lots of different types of sounds, uh, calming sounds, rhythmical sounds, all all potentially potentially great. Uh, we do have to watch what kind of sounds and what kinds of music because we do know different music affects the body differently so it, it, that's yeah that, that, that's another conversation because uh, I want to get through the senses really um the vestibular system of course because the baby is able to float so they are upside down which is massively vestibular um they're not just sitting the way that we do and we spend like 90 90 percent of our day or whatever sitting in front of a screen and we're upright or we're walking or we're talking but babies are flipping and turning and they've got this lovely water to move in and uh just explore so their vestibular systems are getting loads of experiences so if as mum if you can experience lots if you can move lots your baby is going to be getting lots of experience because if you're on your back if you're on your front if you're twisting or if you're swimming then it's just like baby's getting oh baby's on its front as well and it's like getting different vestibular experiences and the vestibular system is so important for so many so many different things um, and then as baby grows, you've got proprioception. So they start and deep touch pressure because they start to get enclosed by the womb and they get bigger. And then mums start to feel the kind of kicks and the punches and the pushes. And that's brilliant for them getting some uh, proprioceptive input, this deep touch pressure that's very calming, that's very organizing. Um, and again, if mum is moving, then baby is having to develop and push and press um, and, and get themselves get themselves happy and, and coordinated in there. So the more ultimately that the, the more sensory experiences that the mum has, then the better for that for that development, uh, stimulation of the development. We can never cause children to develop faster than they were designed to intend, but we can make sure that they're as healthy as possible for the stage that they're supposed to be at. So even if mum is on bed rest. I really would recommend that there are certain, just move where you can, even a slight turn, a slight tilt, because we don't want mum who might be in bed rest to stop moving completely. Um, we need, let, let's give the baby vestibular input because baby needs needs that. Um, and then where possible, obviously we, we do want natural births because that's an incredible compression on the body. There's a lot of muscle tone that starts developing in the neck and vestibular system as they work their way through the birth canal. Um, but if they're like myself and they've had cesareans, well, then we just do what we can when they're actually born and make sure that we give them as good sensory input, as good a start as possible, because I think that's part of the design of, of the birthing process, that it is a massively sensory experience. And it's a very kind of like, Woof, this is who I am as my baby, this or who I am as baby. This is my space. This is what my body does. And, and they, they, yeah, it's just a real squish and a squash. And it's just like, yes. And then they eventually come out into the world and it's like, woo. But then we need to swaddle them because they've just come from this really lovely, gorgeous environment. It's warm. It's controlled. They're getting squished. They're getting squashed. They can use their muscles when they want to. They can move to a point uh, when, when they're big. But yeah. It's uh, just, yeah, feed, think think of what your baby's doing and think of all the sensory experiences that you can give them outside. That's so cool. I, I knew about sound. I remembered that from uh, 20 years ago before my first one was born. Yeah, they can hear sound and that. And I remember um, seeing the baby move and I, I remember that, but I, I didn't know about the light thing. I didn't think they had the, the ability to see any change in the light spectrum. Mm, mm. That's cool. It's lovely. <laughs> right well thank you um it's it's fascinating i love these it's so in, so enjoyable i know people who are watching do which is great uh and they're liking and they're saying yeah thank you for this 
because it's an education and it's one thing to know something and sometimes it can be so helpful to know why not mm -hmm. always and sometimes there's any there's a limit to our intellectual capability of how deep a knowledge which is what you were saying earlier but sometimes like the the the, the, the fact that the the hearing goes straight in that's actually quite important because if we're thinking gosh why a smell so um powerful actually there's a reason why it's not you you're not weird you're not strange actually it's the way your body's designed and that's why smell is so powerful negatively potentially but also so powerful positively potentially as well but understanding that is so key mm. so thank yeah. you right uh what the, this has come back what are the two books you said you got two books on um on sale uh, what are they called okay well one uh the, the two latest books anyway <laughs> um well, more is, than two. yeah <laughs> There was there was one I did that was the number number one Amazon bestseller. That's a little fifteen minute read actually. If folks just want a very quick read up on the senses, um, that's the seven steps to successful sensory processing. So I've got that. That's the first step, which is just fifteen minutes explaining things about like the likes of smell um, and in the olfactory bulb. Um, that's all in in that little book. Uh, and now there will be more. I, I will finish that at some point. So that's seven steps to successful sensory processing and the others will all be positive steps, things that you can do following that. But that's just a nice 15 minute read and that's an ebook, uh, just really quick and simple to download. Um, the other, the, 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 there were three latest, they're of a similar, um, they're, they're, they're similar books together. So the first one is Raising a Sensory Child with Ease. That's what that one is. And then they're tweaked in order to meet the other two, I actually did do two books, one called Home Educating a Sensory Child with Ease and Homeschooling a Sensory Child with Ease. Because I have an international um, business in America and in the States, homeschooling is much more of a term that's used in the circles that I'm in. They're very much more about home education. So that's why I thought, right, OK, I'll just I'll put an offering out there. It's the same book. But it depends on where you happen to sit with that language. So homeschooling a sensory child with ease or home educating a sensory child with ease. And if your child is at school, well, then you want to go with raising a sensory child with ease. Uh, just all by Anne Lord Jackson on Amazon. Ah, so. We'll link to that. Uh, link to your author page on Amazon. Thank we'll you. do that. That's a simple one. Uh, right. Thank you. Um, as ever, it's a pleasure. Really appreciate your time. Um, answering these questions, which is great because you didn't know about at least two of those um <laughs> which was great but that's 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 the joy of this so thank you again for being with us uh, your website just one last time at the end of this interview is anlawjackson.com yeah so go and find out more about her from there uh, thank you have a great rest of your day and uh, we will speak again next week that's brilliant thank you bye